Good morning, everyone. So beautiful to be back in this circle with you. Seems like it's been quite a while. <laughs> I'm going to play a song, um, and I really want to invite all of us to feel this song more than hear this song, okay? Don't try to figure out what the song's lyrics are, but just let, let this music wash over you. It's a song of longing. <laughs> it's a song of longing. And um, for those of you that are listening on YouTube, that's uh, the Mexican way of saying there is a deep longing <laughs> for God. I actually was told that, that I was like, why do they blow these things off? And uh, a Mexican gentleman told me that it's to, it's a call for God. <laughs> so I thought, okay, <laughs> that's nice to hear. <laughs> I've heard many different things. So this song is, it's the longing of the son for the father and the father for the son. This is my experience of it. Oh, we are. 
So we have this uh, opportunity today to come home. Um, it's always there. It's always present. And we either choose to step into that or we choose to step away from it in every moment. So right now, just with us gathering together, you know, I've always heard, and I'm sure you've heard, where two or more are gathered, there I am. And I had this really amazing experience of that recently, where the full impact of what that actually means came into my reality. Where two or more are gathered is not talking about bodies coming together. A gathering is a, is a coming together, a gathering of mind. And we all know from the Course that minds join and bodies do not. And the depth of that is what I want to invite us all into this morning. The absolute truth of that, that we're here together to gather our mind, to be together in the reality of what we are, which is spirit. And there's such a deep mesmerization with form that we are constantly up against this in our minds. What is true gathering? True gathering is having that prayer, always lead the way, always lead the way. This is that divine connection that is with us at all times as we choose it to be so. So where two or more are gathered, there I am. I see it as a pillar of light, say that that's the, the example of the divinity that we share together, that there is this coming together in that, there is this joining, there is this truth, there is this beauty, there is this relaxation. When we can drop all of these ideas of being a human and just let go into this true gathering. So that is our deepest prayer in this moment, Spirit, is that we gather together in our mind, in the truth, in the life of what we are in this moment. And so if there are any feelings inside of any type of anxiety or stress or thoughts of what's happening in your world. Let's just together in mind where we are all joined, that is the only place we will ever join, is in that true prayer of show me what I am. I am not a human. I hear this often, oh we must accept our humanity. No, we must not accept our humanity. We must accept the truth which is we are spirit and that is one spirit waking up. And as we join in a deeper and deeper way with everything that is in our world, everything that we see, otherwise we will be distracted, otherwise we will go off that beam of light and we'll be caught in the mesmerization of Maya, of the matrix, of this illusion. And we can play there all we want, but the beauty and the majesty of what we are and what we are together when we come together with that intention to glimpse the truth, to be with God, to be with each other in this union. And it can be as powerful as you allow it to be. And it is only ourselves that keep it from us. Do we take enough time out in our day to be with God? Call it what you will, I don't care. There is a presence with all, all of us that is always in union and we have veils and veils and veils of forgetfulness because we are so mesmerized with form. And that's not the best use of our mind energy to constantly be trying to figure out form and what it's doing. 
When we can step aside, we can step inward. It might be five minutes, it might be five hours, it might be five days. But it should become, if we are truly desiring this union, this gathering, if we will allow the Spirit to take over our mind and our thoughts, we will have that experience instantaneously. Because we choose whether we're looking through the eyes of our truth or whether we're looking through the eyes of fragmentation. And fragmentation holds nothing that we want. So it's very tricky sometimes as we're shaking ourselves awake to see situations and people and where it affects things and it's just an absolute disaster. And to know that we are always, always choosing in every moment depending on how you feel and that's the beauty of it, how do you feel? So I wanted to talk today and uh, you know just this deep invitation to really listen with your heart. I'm not a public speaker. I'm not an ACIM teacher. I'm just somebody who practices forgiveness very diligently. I never have aspired to be in front of a room and talking, but you know, I don't really see it that way anymore. I see it as it's just what's flowing out and and that we're in this together, that these words are not coming from a particular person, but they're like the highest part of our mind that's calling forth this truth. And if we can join in that and really allow that just to, to for this time together this morning, this short time, to just relax and open, that nothing is being bestowed upon you, but something is rising up to remind you that you are this, that you are this beauty and this love and this peace, and that whatever is not that is it's just a reminder. Anything that feels like conflict can be used like a speed bump on the highway just to bring you back into center and give it no more thought than that. Give it no more thought than that. It's like, oh, okay, huh, I see I'm, I'm being a human. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that this is real, that something's real happening here. And it doesn't mean that we don't, that we, that we deny things, but really we have to come to the awareness that, okay, I may not fully experience this as illusion because I feel hit by it, I feel at effect by it, but the answer is clearly given and that answer is forgiveness. Nothing real can be threatened, nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. That's where forgiveness is taking us to. It doesn't matter what's happening in the world. And it's a trap to think that everything is going to look rosy if you forgive enough. It's, that's a bargain. Did Jesus, was the mirror of the cruci crucifixion as the world saw it, a mirror of his mind? No. He had transcended it. We are being asked to transcend this world. <laughs> this is no small thing. And yet it's just a thought that created the whole thing, seemingly. <laughs> so I wanted to talk today about the power of, of thought. And I don't tell stories very often, but there's a couple of parables in my life that are, I think, very striking that will help us to see how what we believe is what we will experience. And some of you may know this, but um, please open up and listen even more deeply to what message it might be for you. Uh, many years ago, I had a lot to do with horses. And um, I was learning how to train horses. And I went out one day and I was working with a young colt. And they were doing some work on the roof of the barn and it was a beautiful day. It was idyllic, and I loved this horse. So I went to get on, the, on his back, and uh, something happened up on the roof. The workers made some noise or something, and 
And he just absolutely went nuts, this horse. And I went, just in a nanosecond, I was on the ground. I hit the round pen and, and I crashed to the ground. It happened so fast, but there was an awareness that my leg was broke. And I immediately called for help so that somebody would know that there was a situation happening here. And then as soon as I knew that they had me in awareness, I went deeply into, I am not a body, I am free. I am as God created me. And this was probably 12 years ago. And I just laid there in the sun, on the ground, and I just went deeply, deeply into this mantra. I am not a body, I am free. I am still as God created me. And then a friend of mine came and, and put my head in her lap. And we, I knew I had to wait an hour for the ambulance because we were way out in the country. So then my, hus my then husband came and he was all freaked out. And I looked at him and I said, you will have to leave if you are not going to support me in the peace right now. And so he quieted himself down. And I started to go into this beautiful experience of unity. I felt absolutely no pain. And then the first responders got there and they were all in their drama, you know, because they had to set my leg. They wanted to give me morphine. It, apparently it was broken into, my femur was broken in two places. And I kept telling them, no, I don't want any morphine. I want you all to join me in this peace. And of course they didn't know how to, <laughs> the first responders didn't know how to respond. <laughs> and, um, but I was very adamant and they said, listen, and they tried to talk sense to me. We're going to set your leg and it's going to be painful and you need to take some morphine. And I said, no, I will not. And so they set the leg and they loaded me up and uh, took me on this very bumpy road. It's out where the monastery is and it's, it's a dirt road for eight miles. So we were going over these bumps in this ambulance and I was just in a beautiful state of mind. And the nurses were saying, do you want something? Because there were tears coming down my eyes, right? But they were tears of joy because I was having this full realization. And so uh, they, they started asking me questions. What is it that you do? <laughs> and so I told them a little bit about the Course in Miracles. And <laughs> whatever I said, I don't know what I said. And so we got to the hospital and, uh, and then I just said to the doc, he says, I understand you haven't taken anything. I mean, they're all just like completely amazed. And I said, no, but you can do whatever you want now, you know. And so, this experience was so beautiful to me and I, it was at the end of a cycle in 2008 where everything was going wrong. Everything. I, there's a, a YouTube video that I did, a satsang, where I shared the story of 2008. I think the name of the YouTube is the worst year of my life. <laughs> something like that. Something very spiritual. And um, so anybody can reference that, but it was a very intense year and this was the final straw, so to speak, because I had been feeling very stuck. But I had an, an intention for awakening and yet I had my ideas of what that would look like. So there I was with this double broken femur and I couldn't move. So the deeper surrender started with my pathway and then I came into community shortly thereafter. But then I want to share a contrasting experience. This was uh, maybe five years later. Um, I was uh, trying to think of how much I should tell you. <laughs> I was struggling. I was in community and I was, I was up against uh, being a female and I was in relationship with somebody with purpose for the first time, deep purpose of undoing the beliefs in the mind of what even relationship was. 
And um, I fell out of bed and I broke my hip. And I've refused to believe it. First of all, when I hit the floor, I went into complete denial. No. Because to me, what I automatically came up was, if you break your hip, you're old, you're worn out, nobody's going to love you. And it was completely, I was completely wrapped up in this. And um, so for two days, I laid there at the monastery with a broken hip in total denial that it was broken. You were there, weren't you, Laverne? Yeah. yeah. And, um, and I was in suffering. I was suffering because I would not allow that to be the truth because the truth to me was you're old, you're used up, you're not going to be loved. And uh, so my intense resistance and beliefs about aging started to come. They were already there, but now they were really there. <laughs> and so finally I had to submit <laughs> to being picked up in an ambulance again and taken to the same doctor <laughs> for a broken hip. And I went in and I spun out, I spun out bad. I spun out into this darkness. And um, for one month I was, people would walk into my room and I would literally, in not very nice language, tell them to get the F out of my room. I was down, I was, I would, I, I, God was disappearing from my mind, everything was just disappearing. But this heaviness of this belief that if form doesn't look a certain way, you're not going to be loved, and it was just right in my face. And so I went through this process, and I would go to David, and I would say, what, what is wrong with me, you know? What does this mean about me? You know? And he would say to me, it doesn't mean anything. And I would be crying, like, just from the depths, you know, what, what is it? Why did this happen to me? And what does it mean? And he kept reflecting back to me that it meant nothing. Well, what it meant was that I had a strong, strong belief I had a thought in my mind that was poison. And that thought was that I was form. And that form had to be a certain way in order to, to be acknowledged or loved. And it was deeply rooted. And I got to see the deep roots of it. And so you look at these two different stories. One, a double broken femur would trump a broken hip any day, as far as pain goes. <laughs> but I had no beliefs in my mind about a broken leg. None. But it was stacked with belief with a broken hip. So I wanted to just share that because I feel like it was such a hugely different experience. And you know, whatever whatever we believe about ourselves or others is what we will experience. That's pretty powerful. But it also leaves that power within ourselves. We do this to ourselves. I did that to myself because I had that belief. Nothing was being done to me. I could have gone through it exactly like I went through <laughs> the, the broken leg but it was stacked with all of this distortion and the identification with the body and how the body should be. And so I really wanted to share about, uh, you know, this, this idea that we can just go around and think this or that and we can accept our humanity and we, you know, there's just, the world is filled with compromise on what this message is. You know, this is about transcendence of being 
and identifying with being a human that is separate from each other, that has a body that, you know, it's just, it's stacked full of pain. And so as we give our mind and our hearts over to this healing, and really I think of healing as just a recognition of what we are, and letting go of what we're not, and it seems so dramatic sometimes because we're so hugely identified with these painful ideas. And so it's, it's kind of hard medicine sometimes to take that we do this to ourself. But I don't think that Jesus really mints his words too much in The Course in Miracles. And you know, when I first, when I first had The Course in Miracles, um, I had it on my nightstand and I would look down at it and it would be like, at the bottom it said Foundation for Inner Peace. Now I was so clueless, I didn't know that that was the publisher. I thought that was like the tagline for the book, <laughs> you know. But it worked for me, like, okay, this book is the Foundation for Inner Peace, I want that. And, uh, and, you know, we unwind as we unwind, but it does, it does take some focus, you know. When I hit the ground with the horse, I, I had enough awareness, not very much, but enough that I could, my mind immediately went to, I am not a body, I am free. Now, did I know that in my, in my everyday experience? No, I didn't know that as a fact at that time obviously, or the, the hip wouldn't have mattered. But you're only ever dealing with your own thoughts about yourself and others. And that's why we want to look deeply at each other and not see the distortion, because it's our own distortion. If I look at you and see that there's something wrong with you, it's, it's me cutting my own throat. So we want to lift up higher, we want to come out of this mesmerization of form. And it's so alluring. It seems so real. So it does take uh, vigilance to continually, uh, in the beginning stages certainly, it takes a lot of vigilance, a tremendous amount of vigilance to, to let go of these ideas and these beliefs. But this is the freedom that is offered in The Course in Miracles. And you know, um, Orosh and I were talking the other day about, you know, time and linear time and how linear time really is the root of all evil. It really, it, it is what keeps us looping in this mesmerization of form. And you know, uh, if you think that you were born into a world with a history and all of a sudden you're just coming in on it, that's not the truth. You know, when you dream at night, you don't really, when you wake up, you don't really even remember how the dream started. But when you're in the dream, it, it all seems like you're really there, right? It's like us. We don't remember our birth. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like we came in with the whole story. But we also came in with the uh, fact that the separation has never truly occurred. So we've come in with these symbols, say a Jesus symbol, a historical personal Jesus, with a Buddha, with whatever else lights up your mind to truth. That's your light. That is your light reminding you. And, and as you awaken, as you start to awaken, these symbols come in more and more and more. And then they come in with each other. No different than a Jesus. And it's deep, but you know, the more we contemplate these truths, it is so exciting, it is so inspiring. There is nothing ever withheld from us, except for our choice to have it be withheld. It undoes the victim, it undoes the victimizer, they are the same. So to to, you know, when we say, let's be uh, devoted to the holy instant, what does that even mean? Let's be devoted to the truth. Let's be devoted 
Let's have our devotion be to that which brings us true happiness because nothing else does. And that's the truth. Nothing else will bring you happiness. It will be temporary at best. And then it will dissolve into, like everything else that you think this world will bring you, it will dissolve back into some sort of yearning for something else to fill that hole. So we want to use all of our time and our mind energy, seeming time and mind energy, for the devotion to this holiness within. There is such a beauty, and it is a peaceful happiness And it is, it is never not there. It is never not there. That's the good news. But sometimes those blankets of uh, illusion and self-delusion are so thick. I know, believe you, I know. I mean, I was, I, you know, David used to say I was a hard nut to crack. And once you start to feel the beauty of where that intention takes you, once you start to feel that, then you are more attracted to that than you are to the drama of the form. Because form does not matter. I don't know how many times I heard that over and over and over, that form does not matter. So wherever there's pain, wherever there's conflict in the mind or in the body, whatever, it's all the same. It's just an opportunity to invite that holiness to come forward, that holiness within your heart, a holiness that we all share. It's the only thing we share. I've said it many times, personalities will never connect. And they'll just be used as uh, a distraction not to be at peace. Oh, what did you see what she did? Blah, 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 blah. That is so boring. That is so, so boring. There's no life in it. If you get caught up in gossiping or talking about somebody or how somebody else needs to heal, listen to the message for yourself. It's for you. It's not about somebody else. There is nobody else. It sure seems tricky though, doesn't it? It sure seems like there are annoying people in the world. That's why I think Trump is such a good, you know, uh, practice. If you're, of course, a miracle student listening and you hate Trump, then that's your own self-hatred being projected out. That's what the tiny mad idea does. It puts it over there because it's so intolerable to think that it's your own. And not in truth. Not in truth is it your own, but it's what you believe. And, you know, uh, th there's somewhere in the Course it talks about, you know, we can't even imagine the extent of our own self-hatred. Well, it seems like it's getting more and more obvious in the world, which is good. It's good because there is no world. So it's like, how are you seeing it? Do you have an opinion about everything? And if you have opinions about everything, you will forever loop in what those opinions and those beliefs, because your mind is so powerful, your mind is meant to create the beautiful and the sublime. It's not meant to be a bottom feeder on the ground of mesmerization of form and, and what other people seemingly are doing. It's really none of your business. It's like mind your own mind. You will find peace in that immediately when you pull back thinking that you need to figure out other people oh my god and then you'll watch how the miracle you'll live in the miracle you'll watch and see how that reflection starts to change and you'll think it was them oh you've changed so much really you know no and that's what i love you know i i really loved experimenting with this course of miracles i loved experiencing uh, exploring and um, and really using it as as an exploration, like okay, Jesus, you tell me this works, then then I'm going to really go for it in this particular situation where I feel victimized and I have all the evidence in the world. Because you'll have all the evidence in the world, you know. It is the ego's script. 
Let's make that clear. It's the ego script. It's not the Holy Spirit script. It's the ego script. It's already written. It's already over. We just keep focusing on grievances and attack thoughts, and that's why we continue to have the same experience, and that's why we continue not to feel uplifted into the light, because we are choosing not to take this at face value, what Jesus is saying, and really, really apply it. And then it seems like there's bigger situations and smaller situations, and those bigger ones just are not forgivable. Well, there are no hierarchy of illusion. What happens is, is the more that you turn towards the light, the more that you really want this experience of who you are, your naturalness, the ego will get shook up once it knows you're serious. Like we're doing this retreat the end of the month. 12 days. It's a very, it's, we're calling it an intensive retreat because there's three ceremonies. There's the silence, which people don't even like to be in silence with themselves. And of course, the miracles. And you can already feel it getting shook up because you're coming into a divine experience. You're coming into an experience of true love of what you are. And so, of course, the ego is fine when everything is just kind of complacent and, you know, doing a little bit of forgiveness over here, a little bit over there. It's fine. But when you really get serious, then the things can start to shake up, which is great mind training, you know. And when Jesus says that an untrained mind can accomplish nothing, that's very plain. There has to be vigilance and diligence on some level. And I think it can be as beautiful as just giving yourself the love to yourself to spend time with this power, this love, whatever you want to call it. I used to shy away from calling, uh, you know, the word God because it was so convoluted, and then I had the experience of God. <laughs> There's no other word for it. It's just God. It's so amazing. And so these, these. Uh, seeming hours and minutes of this thing called time should be devoted to undoing, should be devoted to true love. You know, uh, we actually think that what we're striving for in the world, even with goals and things of the world, that it's going to bring us that happiness. And, and I think we're all old enough to know that that doesn't really work. That, but this devotion to the miracle, this devotion to this state of mind does work. And it just expands and expands and expands and expands. But you've got to give up a lot of things. You've got to give up being right. You've got to give up your judgments. You've got to give up your opinions. You've got to give up your gossip. You've got to give up a whole lot of stuff that the ego is addicted to. It's an addiction. Now, we can talk about people who have drug addictions and sex addictions and all these kinds of addictions. And the biggest addiction is being a human and thinking that you're something that you're not. We're completely addicted to that identity, and that identity is painful. And so the, ins the, inspiring, the inspiring nature of miracles, it just blows everything away. Because you have to, you know, and especially with big things in your life, right? If you just take these, whatever grievance or whatever you think you're a victim of, if you just take that and you really go to the mat with it, with the spirit, and it dissolves because you are not the healer. Your mind that got you into this mess is not the mind that's going to pull you out. It's that, it's that leaning back into, it's that leaning back into the presence of who you are and joining with that Holy Trinity, just joining with it, like, okay, this I know you're telling me that I am this. I don't believe it. Show me. Show me. I feel like a victim here. I feel like I have been completely done wrong. And then you allow that miracle to come in and shift your perception, because when that happens, and you can't even, and nothing's changed in form, it's all the same, but you're happy, <laughs> it's the most amazing thing ever. I mean, that's where all the juice is. That's where, that's where you start to get so attracted to that light that you're just not interested in the drama anymore. 
you know it used to kind of feed something because you were identified with that which need to be fed which was the ego to stay alive and it needs to be fed by fear thoughts that's how it stays alive and we can undo projection in any moment by releasing our belief in the thoughts that we're having in that moment that are painful at any moment and you can hear yeah I did it myself I'm trying I'm trying I just can't I can't I can't that's why we start we start with the things that are annoying you know we start with with the with the small things because there are no small things in all actuality but you start to see the release that you feel you start to feel the unity with your brother and then it's like why would I look anywhere else and that's what I love about being here in Ahihik and I love being with all of us together you know and that's what I feel I feel like we're in this together like let's rise up and be in it in such a beautiful, sparkly, magical way and then we don't want to look back on grievances and and you know, in just the practice this week of just inviting the Spirit every morning to show you who you are and how does that happen? Well the only way you can see who you are through experience, through direct experience is the release of those of those beliefs it's the power of your own thought. You know, it's an outward picture of an inward condition. Now, what does that mean? It's how you're experiencing it. It doesn't necessarily mean that everything is going to look good, but you won't you won't perceive it in the same way. I went home for a week. I, I, I went up on a mission to pick up this amazing thing that we're going to have here at the Light Center called Aries. It's a healing sound thing, but... I'll talk about that maybe later, but uh, there I was with my sister and my mother, who I love very much, and they're so caught up in the whole everything that's going on in the U.S., right? <laughs> and I was just watching it. I was just watching it, and I was like, wow, I'm so happy that I'm free <coughs> from that kind of intensity, you know? And even any kind of inroad, you know, it just wasn't there. There was no invitation, right? And where there's no invitation, the Spirit doesn't. It's just, you know, like the Holy Spirit, and I love this because the Holy Spirit, it says somewhere in the Course that the Holy Spirit is always standing by waiting for us to change our mind, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so, it, with that as an example, we should always just be standing by in the presence of love, not thinking there's a problem. Seeing there's confusion, yes, okay, there's some confusion, and you can see people getting red in the face and talking about this, that, and the other. But unless there is an invitation, you just get to be the presence of love. You're not responsible for somebody else's mind. You're only responsible for your own. And there's a great deal of release when you actually allow that to be the truth. If you can think just for a moment of all the things that you, you know, uh, think you can help somebody with. <laughs> takes up a lot of mind energy and it and it and it fills you with a, a like almost a heaviness because you think that you're going to have to you know help them and save them and it's like no 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 it's just a call for you to save yourself <laughs> don't look in that direction and it doesn't mean that there aren't helpful things once you have presence of mind for right action but in no situation do we ever know our own business best interest and then the, the next part of that is and everything is for your own best interest if used through looking through the lens of the light within your own mind if used for looking through the light with your own mind but if you're there as a hero of a dream going around trying to save people it's not going to be helpful I'm here to be I, I'm here to be truly helpful what does that mean well the most truly helpful thing you can do is forgive and then turn your mind completely over to the Spirit so the Spirit can guide and direct you so you can be under Christ's control, not conscious control. If you're thinking about how to help somebody a little too much, you are not under Christ's control. You are under conscious control. And consciousness is the first split of the ego. Okay, so we're going way back beyond even that. We're going way back beyond even that. And this is where the Course differs. There's differences. 
with the clarity of what the Course of Miracles is saying is different than most of the things that are being taught now. If consciousness is the first split of the ego, then that wipes out quite a few teachers out there. And I love the Course in Miracles because it's so complete. It's so concise. And yes, there can be different tools that come up underneath us that help us come into that experience of what the Course in Miracles is teaching us. I certainly have been through many. Very grateful, but this, this tiny mad idea of projection has to be recognized. Okay, if you're in conflict in any way, in any way at all, that tiny mad idea is just playing out, playing out, playing out, playing out. It's a big trick. It's a massive trick. And it's not the truth. And we are the only ones that can pull it back and say, okay, I'm afraid, I'm in conflict, I'm having these judgmental thoughts, whatever it is, this is my opportunity to heal. These are my speed bumps on the freeway waking me up and I can either go off into you know, the ditch of where that stuff is taking me and where, how I feel like I have to go over there and fix it or I can let that be a speed bump and bring me back into the light. You can look at problems as no longer problems. You can look at them as things that need to be, you need to take it deeper in your own mind and you need to take it inward to the healer, to the light and release it. Because all you're trying to figure it out is just going to keep you in hell, actually. And then maybe it seems like, you know, you organize some, some illusion over there and you feel a little bit better, but guess what? It'll pop back up over here, maybe with a different person, maybe with the same person. So we want to go for the authenticity. We want to go for the way, the truth, and the life. We want to live in this beam of light and enjoy the last few strips of this film. Because we're only here for another minute. And I think we're all old enough in here to go, how did that happen so fast? How did that go so fast? Well, it's going really fast now. And so we want to just really forgive, forgive, forgive. Be in that relationship. Baby, come home to me. That song is, it's like the spirit saying, come home, come home to me. I've got this. Give me your mind. Give me your thoughts. And the more we relinquish our thought system to the spirit, it can be purified. And the only uncomfortable part about that is you want to be right about something or you actually want something to be true or you want to be loved. So you think you need to do this, 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 and this. You need to hide that you have a broken hip. So some guy you're with will love you because you won't appear to be as old as you actually are or something, whatever. <laughs> So this is a very inspiring path. And it's inspiring as you uh, test. You do the test runs with forgiveness. And you give yourself fully over to it. And you don't even have to understand how it works. I love being clueless. I love, I love not knowing. I just know that if I just lay it on the altar, and if I have a mighty companion to work with with that, when it's really sticky, all the better. But that mighty companion better be able to join with you in the presence of God because if that mighty companion is sitting over there going, yeah, you really are, well, you've got a lot going on, it's not going to be helpful as you lay your, 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 your sorrows onto the altar. Please, even if it's only for five minutes with somebody, release your judgment of what they're going through, release your opinion about what they're going through. They're actually going through nothing in reality. If you're upset and opinionated and doing all those things that you can't stand about yourself or other people usually, you're actually doing nothing. Isn't that gentle? That's what Jesus says. 
There's no harm, no foul. It's just you're going to have this experience if you do this. Okay, you want to do it again? Go ahead. I'm standing here in love, joy, happiness, unbounded. <laughs> but if you want to play that loop out again and judge your sister or brother or yourself, because that's a big trap with course students is they, they think they got it with letting go of judging their brother, but then it all goes on to themselves. It's the same thing. This avatar is no different than that avatar. You know, we're just, we're one mind waking up. Let's join, let's truly gather, let's, let's, let's really put it to the test this week in whatever you're doing. Where two or more are gathered, there I am. I don't know why it took me so long to actually experience that, what that even meant. I mean, I experienced it, but it, I never, I never connected. I thought it was like when we all get together, you know. It's like no, <laughs> it's <laughs> and that's why the invitation is so strong. Uh, I feel so inspired about that invitation, that we come together, and and that our priority is purpose. Our priority is that purpose. Of, of really going for the miracle, that holy instant together. There's, otherwise, you might as well, you know, if, you're not, if, you're, if, you, if that's not your intention for your day, then, you know, don't question at the end of the day why it is that you didn't feel inspired or you didn't have a good day or there's inconsistency. And this takes practice, obviously it takes practice, but what happens is you start to, you know, you start to be so attracted to that attractiveness of the spirit that it, you, you become very uninterested. You lose your appetite for drama. You lose your appetite for judgment. So just, if anything, to take away from today, that if there's any sort of uneasiness or conflict, that it's just, it's a speed bump that wants to bring you back home. Use everything of this world for that purpose. Because otherwise you'll be caught in the mesmerization of the form. You'll be caught in dramas and scenarios that if you just step back and let this this presence within you lead the way, it will it will do whatever it does, and it will no longer you'll no longer feel responsible for it. Responsibility thoughts. That's why when you are so joined with the spirit, guilt dissolves because there's no personal self there trying to make up a decision about something. When you're overthinking something, you can be assured. It's time to stop. It's time to hand this over. So the power of our thought and the power of the, you know, thought is, thought is highly overrated. Being intelligent, being logical, you know, we have to learn to listen with another ear. We have to learn to listen below the words so that you can actually be present with your brother or sister and actually hear what's, what they're saying. Because lots of times people can be smiling at you and telling you all kinds of stuff, but if you, can, if you are present enough, you can feel what's actually really happening, you know? And to be that presence, to be that calmness, to, to bring that peace into every situation is a gift. You become a gift. You become a blessing. Who, what, what, what is there in this world that would be better than that? <laughs> you know? <laughs> a new job, a new car, a new partner. I mean, come on. Let's be blessings. <laughs> Sitting here next to the Blessings, blessings. Cafe. <laughs> yeah, so... 
So I, I, my prayer is that we are all joined in this, this week, uh, that we put the power of love before everything and then let whatever is not that be dissolved. You know, it's not about sugar coating or throwing pink paint on your seeming pain. It's, yes, recognize, but don't hang out there. And then ask that healer to come into your mind because that's the only way we'll ever be convinced that there's something bigger than our little selves running around trying to figure it out. We want to be convinced that we are loved beyond. So. <laughs> so I hope these words were helpful. Uh, you know, those stories to me were, were quite convincing <laughs> for myself on my own journey. And um, I know that we've all had, had them, and I w actually would really like to get together and share those at some point, maybe in the chapel, just to really share these contrasting experiences, because I think that the stories that we all live through and, and we come out on the other side of are, are very helpful as we approach our own stories and start to let them go. So thank you for, for being here with me and uh, it's been a bit of a wild ride coming up here and <laughs> seemingly doing what we're doing with uh, retreats and kind of reconfiguring things here and and I do feel I do feel you guys I feel I, I, two days ago because I, I, I came back from the states on I think Wednesday seems like it was a long time ago but it was a very quick trip and I I just really wanted to be here today with you yeah, so I appreciate you showing up and Let's just bask in this truth. Yeah. Thank you. So I can tell you a little bit about Aries if you want to hear about it. <laughs> I don't know who, how many people know this story, but... Um, If you, you can get up and leave in the middle of it if you find it, like, it's fine, it's, it's not gonna, no people pleasing, okay. Um, but it's a really fun story, and Laverne and I went to Utah in the summer, and, um, and she was just, we were just actually looking at the Blessings Cafe as a, a place for people to come to, and she kept, she kept hearing, um, that we wanted to have it be like a real reverent space and you could put these headphones on and listen to really beautiful music and drink the cacao and just be very present, right? So I said, well, let's go see Jim Fosgate, who's a friend of mine. He invented Dolby surround sounds, okay? So I said, well, let's just go see Jim. He'll know just what headphones to get or whatever, you know, and I don't know. <laughs> we weren't really, it was just like a prompt to go see them. Now, they were one of the, they were, they were two of the people him and his wife that had the biggest reaction to me leaving my life because we were very good friends and we were entangled. And they were hurt. And so they were screaming at me. And, you know, just, you need to question your spiritual path. You're having an affair with David Hoffmeister, whatever it was. They were just screaming because they were afraid to lose me, right? And I understood it. Um, and so I held them in love deeply in my heart because if I went down that other, like, what am I doing, what am I doing to them, I held them in love, held them in love. And two weeks later she called me and all she could say was, I love you, I love you, I love you. Nobody understood what I was doing back then, not even myself. So anyway, we go, we go see them. And so there's been this 10 years where I haven't really, really been with them, right? A couple of times I felt like it was smoothed over a little bit, but... So we go up there and we just have, we walk in and seriously, within 15 minutes, Jim is talking about this new invention uh, called Aries. 
that he's named Aries. So he starts telling us about it, it's headphones. And what he did was he, he, I don't know if you guys saw my post, I put a post up, I'm getting ahead of myself. But anyhow, um, so we're there and he's sharing about this technology that he invented that, um, that healed his PTSD. He had severe PTSD and he couldn't even go out of his house. And, um, and the doctors were telling him he needed to meditate. He needed to learn how to meditate and he couldn't. He said he couldn't do it. It, uh, it usually would trigger it. So he decided to invent some sort of sound because he had the inventor of surround sound. I mean, he's gonna go to what he knows. And so he, he did this and he was able to meditate with this, this whatever music he chose to come through this system that he had created that he said was way beyond surround sound, but it was on headphones. And so I said, wow, we need to interview you, you know. So we did, we went back a few days later and we interviewed him and um, it's on my Facebook page of his experience and what I love so much about that is he had a prayer for healing, right? Like, he, he was in trauma a lot. And so, he's a mystical guy. And this is how it came in for him. Now, I'm not giving Aries the causation. It's the prayer of the heart for healing. And whatever comes in to support that will come in and support it. So it's not like you push anything away. You accept what's coming towards you. That's why we have it here now. It's not because Aries is going to heal you. I don't believe that. I don't believe medicine heals you. You know, I don't believe reading, you know, lines in a book called A Course of Miracles heals you. There's a prayer in your heart. There's a reflection in your mind, and it's going to match that. And as we wake up, everything starts to get brighter and brighter and brighter, right? The reflections of love start coming while putting on headphones and listening to some beautiful music that cracks you open. That's, that's the spirit, okay? It's not some technology, you see, because there's nothing outside of the mind. So don't get caught in the trap of thinking, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, you get, no, we're not giving anything here the power, we're giving all the power to the spirit. So, so we, um, we did this uh, interview and, um, and we didn't know, we left, we're like, we don't even know why we did that interview. What are we doing interviewing Jim Fosgate? You know, we just didn't know. And so it sat there for a couple of months. And then I got this call from this guy in California and um, I had met him a year and a half before. He uses medicine and A Course in Miracles uh, very deeply for his own uh, meditations and, and, and awakening. He was sharing something about it, about this technology that he was uh, privy to. And I said, oh, well, you know, my friend and I went and saw Jim Fosgate and he has this healing, healing sound device, right? And I said, and you know, because I know that this friend of mine, his name is Bill, knows Judy Scutch who is the publisher of A Course in Miracles, one of the original four that brought The Course in Miracles into this world. And I said, you know, in Absence from Felicity, the book about Helen Schuckman, she asked Jesus the question, tell me about the power of healing through light. And Jesus said, no, it's not through light, it's through sound. So he gave her 29 pages for this healing sound machine, which never went anywhere. So I said to Bill, hey, my friend invented surround sound. He's done this healing machine. Let's get those schematics from Judy Scutch and see if she'll let us take them to Jim Fosgate. So he calls me a couple days later and sends me an email from Judy because she remembered me from putting together a fundraiser for the Foundation for Inner Peace a few years ago. Beautiful letter from Judy saying, you know, lots of gratitude and, uh, and she said, this has been taken to, to engineers, physicists, all sorts of people. They've looked at this, but they couldn't make sense out of it. And so she just said, let's join in the mystery of this and see if maybe Jim Fosgate might be able to, to make sense out of it. 
So she goes, these documents have been shown to very few people. So she gave them to me. And I'm like sitting there like, you can't make this stuff up, right? I mean, seriously. So, um, so I, I, I called Laverne, I said, listen, well, that was, yeah, I, I got a little ahead of myself, but I called Laverne before the request to Judy Scutch for the interview with Jim, so we could give her something that she could see Jim and, and get a feel for him. And she was up all night editing this video. Boom, gives it to me. And Jim, I send it to Jim, the interview, because he hadn't seen it, and also this request. But I wanted to share with him in depth about this request, because I, I said, he's not, this isn't just some little channel or in their basement channeling Jesus. This is like the Course of Miracles. This is Jesus gave these schematics to this woman, you know? And uh, so he was so excited about the interview that we did. He said it was the best interview he's ever seen him do, himself do, and he was just so thrilled about it that uh, the next day he called and said yes to, to looking at the things from Jesus. But I said, I want to be with you when you do that, I want to be in prayer with you. And, you know, it's not, this is no small thing. So anyway, then he, he tells me that there's, they're trying to roll this out in project, production, but because of COVID, it's been delayed. There's only three in existence. And he said, I want your center to have one. And um, yeah, I just felt so grateful that it's there to bless and inspire and do whatever it does, you know. But the beauty of it is, you know, just to listen and follow, because that's all we did. We didn't even know why. Plus, there's this beautiful reunion with us, right? And his sign-offs are, let's heal some folks, you know, stuff like that, like so beautiful, right? We have this, and he said it even, we were on, Eros and I was on the call with him the other day, and he brought it up. He goes, yeah, it didn't quite go the way we thought it was going to go, but now maybe because we're together again, it's going to be even better. <laughs> and so it's a full circle, you know, and it took time. It seemingly took time, but it's the mind. It's a reflection of my deep commitment and devotion to, to true healing. You know, this isn't about bringing in magical methods. It's like, okay, this is what's presenting itself. And then, and my friend Bill who, uh, you know, is very good friends with Judy Scutch. Uh, they live right by each other. They're very, they're very good friends, you know, and he talks to her all the time about the medicine and, and doing the medicine and, and the course and how it's brought it to life for him. And, and she's just so supportive of everything, you know. She says, well, I'm 89 years old. If I was younger, I might try that. But. <laughs> Anyhow, um, so we have it here, and, 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 and we were going to have, we were going to go to Sedona and spend time with him and pick up Aries uh, and spend time with him with these documents, these 29 pages, but because of COVID, uh, they, they're, very, they're a little bit guarded, so they were still in Utah, so I, uh, we decided not to have it shipped because you never know what's going to happen to it, so I flew up just to pick it up, and... Um, and so he handed it to me in a big Costco bag, and we were just like <laughs> waving, and Normie was dancing around, and, and it was it was really fun. But we only had a few minutes together. Uh, but because of technology, we can Skype and look at things. But um, yeah, we had our first uh, session with it, actually, real really last night, and. I you know it's all, both of us we're like we can't really explain it. It's. Uh, it seems to drop your mind down very, very deeply to where it needs to go. That where you're in the center of this vibration. And, um, and we were just, we were talking afterwards and it just, we were kind of in the same space, like, wow, you know. Um, but I had been in prayer all day. See, I'd been in prayer all day uh, to just, I always go into quiet before satsang. And it was almost like this beautiful kiss, you know, this beautiful kiss from spirit and uh, unexplainable, really. But um, I'm sure that you'll all have an opportunity to, to try it here because what he did was he, he configured it so 22 people could be on it at the same time. So we have this... Uh, so we have to order 
20 headsets. <laughs> you know, we just keep saying yes. But um, so in group settings, it's going to be fabulous during the retreat because we're going to offer it every day during the retreat, every night. Um, and so we'll, we'll work it out so that everybody can, can experience it. But there was a deep calm. It's almost like, wow, you know, like, I, I don't know. I, words aren't going to do it justice. But, uh, but it is a reflection of mind. And I will forever, forever keep bringing that up. I, you know, I'm really a stickler on thinking that something outside of you is, is healing you. It's not the truth. It can appear that way because the mind is not ready to accept the power that it holds. So these symbols can come and, you know, dance in my, on my scene any time. It's fine. But it's, it's really beautiful to, to watch how uh, the orchestration of, of things happen when you get out of the way. When there's no personal self, there's no personal agenda, life is, life is a, a very, very fun, happy, peaceful ride. And so to release those concepts of personhood, and please don't accept being a human. 